Today on Rappler, an investigative report says Aimee Marcos, daughter of the late dictator Ferdinand Marcos, is a beneficiary of a secret offshore trust. The position of the Malaysian government is that the Sabah conflict does not affect the peace process. President Aquino's position is that the Sabah conflict does not affect the negotiation. That is also the position of the MLA. Moro Islamic Liberation Front negotiator Mogher Iqbal says the Sabah standoff will not affect peace talks between the government and the MILF. And the United States prepares its missile defenses after North Korea says it approved nuclear strikes on U.S. targets. Hello, I'm Ai Makaraig, sitting in for Maria Ressa. Welcome to Rappler, your social news network. The Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism says Ilocos Governor Aimee Marcos is a beneficiary of a secret offshore trust called Sintra Trust. Aimee is the eldest child of the late Philippine dictator Ferdinand Marcos. Sintra Trust was formed in June 2002 in the British Virgin Islands. Documents also show Aimee was a financial advisor for Sintra Trust and Comcenter Corporation in which Sintra Trust was a beneficial shareholder. Aimee was also a master client for the M-Trust, formed in Malaysia and closed in July 2009. Philippine law requires government officials to, to disclose their assets, no matter where they are held. Marcos's disclosure statements do not list the three offshore entities. The Presidential Commission on Good Government wants to find out if the offshore accounts contain some of the estimated $5 billion her father allegedly amassed. Ferdinand Marcos also held offshore accounts, which the Philippine government wants to freeze. PCGG Commissioner Maita Chan Gonzaga says, If funds came from the pre-1986 Marcos secret deposits, then those responsible for moving the funds around could be committing money laundering. Aimee mean, Marcos's offshore assets are unknown, but the statements she filed show wealth that is significant by Philippine standards. PCIJ examined 12 of the 15 statements she filed when she was a member of Congress and as provincial governor. The statements show that her assets, consisting mostly of inherited jewelry, paintings, and artifacts, rose in value from about $170,000 or 6.72 million pesos in December 1998 to about $640,000 or 27.9 million pesos in December 2011. The PCIJ also reports most of the statements it examined were not specific in listing her business connections and financial interests. When asked by the PCIJ to comment, Marcos did not respond. She is running unopposed for a second term as governor in May. The Philippine government says it plans to investigate an allegation that Aimee Marcos is the beneficiary of a secret offshore trust. PCGG Chairman Andres Bautista says, quote, We are duty-bound to investigate and, depending upon informed preliminary findings, decide whether to pursue the matter. The PCGG is a presidential body tasked to recover the billions of dollars the Marcos family allegedly stole from government coffers during the late president's 20-year rule. The PCGG has recovered $4 billion in assets the Marcoses illegally acquired. Bautista previously said the commission was considering giving up the chase for the hidden billions. He adds, it's been 26 years and people you're after are back in power. At some point, you just have to say we've done our best. Moro Islamic Liberation Front Peace Panel Chairman Mohger Iqbal says the Saba standoff will not have a major effect on the peace process between the MILF and the Philippine government. In October 2012, the government and the MILF signed the framework agreement which will establish the Bangsamoro as an autonomous political entity. The peace talks will resume next week after it was postponed on March 25. You think this will ultimately have an effect on, on the peace process? How, how the South Minor stand effects, yes. Out? But uh, I think a major, a major, major effect, I, I don't imagine. I don't imagine. Because the position of the Malaysian government is that the Sabah conflict 
does not affect the peace process. President Aquino's position is that the South of conflict does not affect the negotiation. That is also the position of the MILF. Iqbal also comments on the Sultanate system. He says the MILF is in favor of preserving the Sultanate, but it will not revive it. Malaysia is the facilitator of the peace talks. The country is gearing up for general elections, with Prime Minister Najib Razak dissolving parliament in preparation for the polls. Singapore Management University political science professor Bridget Welsh says whoever wins the polls will have to face the Sabah issue. I think the problem in Sabah has really left an imprint among Filipino society and Filipinos about what, how, how Filipinos have been treated. Whoever takes over power in, in government will have to face the problems of solving the questions of immigration in the area of Sabah and dealing with some of the security questions that have come up. The United States Pacific Fleet fires four officers of the USS Guardian for failing to, quote, adhere to standard U.S. Navy navigation procedures when the minesweeper ran aground the Tubataha Reef in January. NavyTimes.com reports the relieved officers include Commanding Officer Lieutenant Mark Rice, Navigator and Assistant Navigator Lieutenant Daniel Tyler, and an unnamed officer of the deck. The names of the other sailors involved were not released. The four officers are temporarily reassigned to other duties. Foreign Affairs spokesperson Raul Hernandez welcomes the report. He says, We respect the decision of the relief of the officers and crew members by the U.S. Navy. A team from the Philippine government and major universities are conducting a probe to assess the damage caused by the incident. Hernandez says the results of the investigation will be independent from the U.S. Navy findings. Salvage teams removed the last piece of the USS Guardian, March 30. Cebu's real estate market has a new growing niche thanks to its lower pace of life. ILO reports. Cebu's reputation as Manila's quieter, more relaxed city has earned it a new niche in the real estate market, retirees. Quality of life is what Cebu offers the best. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's something that's in the horizon uh, because uh, Cebu is uh, positioned as one with, uh, a, where quality of life is, uh, is better than the other cities because like it's uh, a cosmopolitan uh, center of sort no i mean if you want to go to the beaches it's like a few minutes away if you want to play golf it's just five minutes away you know and it's it's a very livable city and it's easy for you to move around and actually it's more productive to be here than the other cities that i know because it's easy for you to be hopping from one place to the other. To bring in foreign tourists, Cebu Mactan is expanding its terminals and adding new international routes. The great thing about Cebu is that it's easy come, easy go, meaning it's so easy to enter Cebu, it's so easy to leave Cebu because it's accessible from Korea directly, from many parts of from Singapore directly, so you, you completely bypass Manila. Cebu offers a slower pace of life, proximity to beaches, and manageable distances compared to the more hectic Manila. Marco Sarmiento is one developer who's set to take advantage of this. His latest development is a 14-unit retirement village catering to the Japanese. The Japanese have been coming here as tourists for many years, and Cebu, actually, to them, they look at Cebu as... I don't, a lot of them don't even think of Cebu and the Philippines. They think of Cebu as, as a separate destination, as a tourist spot, as a hub um, for, for beach, for golf, for um, just to get away from you know, the high-stress lifestyle, high, the, the fast-paced lifestyle of Japan. Each unit is designed to appeal to Japanese aesthetics. Adjustments are made for older residents. So we worked with our architect um, on really developing something that's that's catered to the Japanese. If you want it to be like, I always bring up the, the word niche and different, and that obviously had to be implemented to the units, right? So um, you'll notice that, you know, when you enter, there's, there's, there's a section where the Japanese are very particular with where they, where they put their shoes because they, they don't have shoes in their houses. So it's all slipper based or, or barefoot. Um, so there's a section for that room. 
and the bathroom is really catered to the Japanese where they have a separate area for bathing and for showering. And we said, well, their, their, their reaction has been um, good, uh, very good. They're excited about it. They like the idea that it's new, it's different. There's nothing like it in Cebu. Um, they like the idea that it's um, a private community, that it's only for Japanese. As the Philippines' real estate industry booms, Cebu is jumping on the bandwagon and using its laid-back image to rope in demand. ILO, Rappler, Cebu. The United States prepares its Pacific missile defenses after North Korea says it authorized plans for nuclear strikes on U.S. targets. U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel says Pyongyang's threats represent a, quote, real and clear danger to the U.S. and its allies South Korea and Japan. Hegel says, they have nuclear capacity now, they have missile delivery capacity now, we take those threats seriously. The Pentagon says it will send ground-based missile interceptor batteries to protect military bases in Guam. On Thursday, the North Korean military says it received final approval to launch merciless military strikes on the U.S. The general staff of the Korean People's Army says U.S. threats will be smashed by cutting-edge smaller, lighter, and diversified nuclear strike means. The White House tells North Korea to stop making threats after the Hermit State approves nuclear strikes on the U.S. National Security Council spokeswoman Caitlin Hayden says, quote, We've seen today's statement by North Korea again making unhelpful and unconstructive threats. She adds North Korea should stop its provocative threats and instead concentrate on abiding by its international obligations. Last month, North Korea threatened a preemptive nuclear strike against the U.S. Pyongyang successfully carried out nuclear tests, but most experts think it is not yet capable of striking U.S. bases or territory. Let's now look at Rappler's Wrap for today, a list of the 10 most important events around the world you shouldn't miss. At number 5, the youngest daughter of Spain's King Juan Carlos is summoned to court over allegations her husband misused public funds. Princess Cristina's husband Iñaki Urdungarin denies any wrongdoing. The BBC reports he is suspected of having massively over overcharged local authorities for organizing sporting events. There are allegations millions of euros ended up in offshore bank accounts of companies he controlled. Princess Christina is alleged to have been involved as she supposedly knew about her husband's financial affairs. At number 8, following reports of three deaths in China due to a new strain of bird flu, the World Health Organization curbs fears of the pandemic. The number of cases of H7N9 bird flu in China looks set to climb as experts identify previously unexplained infections. But a WHO representative says lack of evidence of human-to-human -human transmission means the risk of pandemic is low. And at number 10, veteran U.S. late-night TV host Jay Leno bows out after 22 years on the iconic Tonight Show, clearing the way for young star Jimmy Fallon to take the show to New York. Leno's relations with NBC, NBC have been strained as he made a series of gags in his opening monologues about the network's poor ratings and his bosses. For the full, for the full top 10, visit Rappler.com's The Rap. Every story on Rappler has a mood meter which gives you 8 emotions to choose from. Click how you feel and your vote comes down to the mood navigator in the middle of the front page which crowdsources the mood of the day. It also gives you the top 10 stories that got the most clicks. Let's take a look at today's top stories. Today's biggest story made it to the Mood Navigator, Aimee Marcos tied to secret offshore trust. It has 79% of readers feeling angry. Another political story lately, Be Nice, Nothing Wrong With Four Of Us In Government has 81% of people feeling angry, 16% annoyed. But we also have a lot of stories in green for the mood happy. From the move section, greener transport offers hope for Metro Manila, 70% happy. And the story that got the most clicks from our business section, Rubini and PH Credit Upgrade predictions come true, 77% happy. All contributing to the mood of the day, today, most people are happy. That's, that's Rappler's newscast for today, Thursday, April 4, 2013. Visit Rappler.com and watch your newscast Monday to Friday. Tell us how you feel on our mood meter and help us crowdsource the mood of the day. I'm Ayi Makaraig and as we say at Rappler, 
tomorrow begins today.